Hello friends and welcome to episode 5 of the Mythological Africans Deep Dive series. This time we're talking about divination practices. W's and 1H method to explore our topic today. We'll start with the question of what divination is, and this will include a review of different types of divination. Then we'll look at who performs divination, when and where divination is performed, how divination is performed with examples from various parts of the African continent, and then we'll end on the question of why divination is performed. So what is divination? The best definition I've seen so far comes from Philip Peake's African Divination Systems Ways of Knowing, and here I paraphrase it as a process of consulting highly trained specialists who use standardized rituals, which are often part of a larger system of knowledge, to obtain information or insight about past, current, or future events, usually for the purpose of decision making or problem solving. Now, you may notice that certain words are highlighted in this definition. Process, highly trained specialists, standardized rituals, systems of knowledge, past, current, or future events, decision-making, and problem-solving. And this is for a purpose. Um, first, to emphasize the fact that divination is an information technology which uses standardized processes to access and organize information. Now, where is this information accessed from? You could say defined entities such as ancestors, spirits, gods, or from the universe or whatever name you use to describe the network of relationships between people, objects, and dynamics that make up life. The other thing to note is that it is situated within the context of a wider system of knowledge. So it's not just willy-nilly the worldview of the diviner who you're consulting or your worldview as a client um, influences what interpretations you draw. So if you're doing divination as someone from the Yoruba people, then the Yoruba worldview and specifically the Odu Ifa is, is the system of knowledge that you're working with. Divination is best performed by highly trained specialists and this is not to say that individuals cannot you know, perform divination for themselves. We'll see some examples of that going forward. But because of its technical nature, um, it is often said that divinations are best performed by people who have been well trained in the methods, in the interpretations. And it is used to seek out knowledge about past, present or future events for decision making or problem solving. So this brings to the front the utility of the technology. Let's focus a little bit on divination systems because these are the these are the tangible technologies that divination is done with. And what I will do is just read this definition again from Philip Peake's African Divination Systems Ways of Knowing. So a divination system is a standardized process deriving from a learned discipline based on an extensive body of knowledge. This knowledge may or may not be literally expressed during the interpretation of the oracular messages. A diviner may utilize a fixed corpus, such as the Yoruba, Ifa, Odu verses, or a more diffuse body of esoteric knowledge. Divining processes are diverse, but all follow set routines by which otherwise inaccessible information is obtained. Some type of device is usually employed, from a simple sliding object to the myriad of symbolic items shaken in the diviner's basket. Sometimes, the diviner's body becomes the vehicle of communication through spirit possession. Some diviners operate self-explanatory mechanisms that reveal answers, and other systems require the diviner to interpret cryptic metaphoric messages. The final diagnosis and plan for action are rendered collectively by the diviner and the client. And I like this divination because it gives a little bit more meat to the process. Um, the tendency is for divination to, especially African divination, to be perceived as this weird, uh, uh, superstitious 
means of acquiring information which may be faulty. And what I like about how a Philip Peak explains the process is that it's simply a means of accessing information to inform decision making, which is best done through people who have been well trained. So let's talk a little bit about types of divination. There are four main types of divination. The first is material divination, which itself is divided into four subtypes. There is lot divination, ecstasy, which is a word I love, friction oracles, and the examination of animal tracks. There is also trans or possession divination, psychomotoric divination, and ominous or oneric divination. Material divination refers to divinatory pronouncements made after manipulating or observing a random generator. And two things to note about material divination is that the manipulation or observation is done in a specific way, and the random generator, which could be an object, could be an animal, is not unique or idiosyncratic, you know, but it is defined and understood within the local culture. So to put some more uh, context around this, you might have a a carved figurine or a bone that is something that is common to people all over the world but within the context of the culture where the divination is being done that carved figurine or that bone is understood in a certain way similarly you might have an animal which is used as part of a divination and it might just be a goat or a sheep um, or a chicken and that's uh, you know an animal that is found all over the world but within that particular culture that animal um, is understood in a specific way the first kind of uh, material divination, lot divination, involves observing and interpreting positions and relational patterns of um, an object or as objects used as a random uh, generator. And examples include bone throwing, um, ifa divination, which uses the opele, uh, hakata or sikidi tablets. And hakata is a form of uh, tablet divination which is done in Southern and Central Africa. And sikidi tablets are mostly used in Madagascar. And here we have um, some pictures of Isangomas examining bones which have been thrown, um, an Ifa divination board with an opele on it, as well as hakata tablets. Now, something interesting that I realized as I was doing the reading for this is that the 2N not notation is very common in lot divination um, on the African continent, but also around the world. So um, the Sikidi divination involves throwing some seeds and observing their configurations. And there are 16 possible combinations um, which you can read up from the Sikidi seeds. Um, of course, 16 is 2 to the 4th power. There are also 16 Hakata combinations, 2 to the 4th power. And then there are 256 um, Ifa combinations, which is 2 to the 8th power. And something um, interesting to note here is the number 4, which has a lot of symbolism across the world. So if you look at the Jewish system, for example, the, the name for, for God, Yahweh, is that those four letters. But what I found out as well is that the name for the supreme being um, amongst many African people, which it's similar, there is Nyame, which is like the Western Ghana area, there is Zambi, um, which is more Southern and Central Africa and Zambi. Um, it's believed that that name has its root in four um, special letters which refer to the powers below. And I didn't do a whole lot of digging into that um, as well because that's not exactly the focus of this that might be out of the scope of this uh, uh, discussion. But the, the paper that I cite here by Van Binsbergen goes into, uh, goes into that a little bit and I highly recommend. So just an interesting you know, notation here that I, I saw. There are also friction oracles whose interpretations are based on the awareness of differences in friction in the movement of the oracle. And um, the interpretations usually go along the lines of if the, the movement of the oracle, which could be rubbing palms together or moving an object along some, um, some, some base, if there is friction or interrupted movement, that, is, that means something. And if the movement is smooth, then that doesn't mean anything significant. And when we look at an example, when we look at how divination is done, there's an example of a friction oracle that we'll talk about. There is also ecstasy, which um, involves examining the entrails of a sacrificial animal um, for a particular sign. So what this ha well, how this works is that the animal is ritually killed 
and then cut open and its intestines are laid out and examined. And a common interpretation is that if there are black spots or lumps, this has negative implications. And if there are no black spots, then that has positive implications. The other type of material divination is examining animal tracks or other random effects created by animals in a formalized man-made setting. And this includes crab divination, spider divination, or um, pale white fox divination, which is done by the Dogon people. Um, I have a blog post which I did on the Mythological Africans Medium blog, which goes into the details of crab or spider divination. I'll share the link with the references so you can read that for more information. But when we look at how divination is done, we'll focus on the pale white fox divination done by the Dogon people. Outside of material divination, there is transpossession divination, and this includes or refers to divinatory pronouncements made by a diviner based on subjective impressions which come from non-human agencies or impersonal powers. So a diviner will look at, put themselves in a trance by looking at a bowl of water or some other mirrored surface, uh, drumming, dancing, they could consume some psychoactive material and then make um, divinatory statements and this is taken to be the words of the ancestors or the gods or the supreme being. And we'll have an example of that when we look at how divination is done. Psychomotoric divination. Um, this one was new to me and I found it very interesting. So these are divinatory pronouncements made after observing um, non-speech motor patterns. This is a fancy way of saying movement, but specifically dancing, um, which would be performed by the, di uh, the diviner or by the client in more or less involuntary response to a variety of stimuli, which could be musical, um, olfactory, so by smell, or some other sensory stimuli. And with the example of music, we'll specifically talk about the cult of affliction um, method of divination and how in the how how divination is done section. But there are also a specific type of divination often found amongst hunters where they smell out information, which I thought was very interesting as well. Then there is ominous divination, which is basically dream interpretation. So these are divinatory pronouncements made after a client talks about something that they witness or experience in a waking state or in a vision, in a hallucination or a dream. And these are typically interpreted using um, fixed uh, uh, catalogs of information, such as dream manuals. And we'll look at an example, I believe, from Morocco when we talk about ominous divination. One thing I do want to focus on is the difference between divination and fortune telling. So divination uses information from the past and present to solve problems or inform decision making which might have an impact on the future. And divination is generally considered to be a much more serious and comprehensive practice embedded in a well-defined system of knowledge. So obviously there are aspects of fortune telling and divination. However, fortune telling is just generally considered a less serious exercise than divination and it's mainly con uh, concerned with predicting future events. Amongst African people, trained specialists and their assistants are usually the ones engaged to perform divination. Chiefs, kings, other leaders such as family, clan or village elders are also sometimes engaged to perform divinations. And in this case, they are either well, knowledgeable enough to interpret the results by themselves or they rely on the expertise of the trained specialists to interpret the results. Who becomes a diviner? Amongst African people, it usually tends to be twins, queer people, or neurodivergent people because it's believed that they experience the spirit realms in a different way than regular people do. And how this works is that once you fall into this category of people who are thought to be you know, destined to become diviners, you are trained. And this can be a very long period. Um, if at, uh, diviners in the IFA system, it takes up to 16 years to train them sometimes. And granted, they get training in herbalism and ethics and other topics but it takes that that much time to develop the the corpus of knowledge that you need to um, lean on as you do your interpretations and advise people in many countries they have guilds of diviners which are you know sanctioned by the government and this is to ensure that there is an a sense of ethics in the practice uh, something that happens often amongst uh, diviners on the African continent is that they have to cultivate relationships with their spirits 
And this can be a really delicate process because it's believed that if you don't propitiate these spirits well or treat them well, they can make life very difficult for you. Across the continent, there are many names by which diviners are called. Um, Mganga or Mganga is a common term used to refer to diviners in the Central African, Eastern African uh, region. There's also Sangoma um, in South Africa and other parts of the Southern African continent, um, and well-known Babalawo or Iyalawo from the Yoruba. But there are also terms like Komien, which, which is found amongst the uh, Bole people in Ivory Coast. There's Salti, Gators, Ngum, Adroga, and all these names which are used to refer to diviners. So when and where is divination performed? When? Quite often at the client's request. So a person has an issue that they need the diviner's skills for. They'll make an appointment and go to see the diviner. Um, divinations are also done at special occasions, such as when a child is born or when there is a wedding, to determine you know, the child's destiny or to see if the union which the wedding represents is going to be auspicious. Divination is also done before people travel or go hunting, which are activities which incur a certain amount of risk. So um, the gods, the ancestors, the supreme being, the spirits are consulted to see if there is anything that people should be aware of or worry of. Um, in response to events that affect the community, so a good example is when there is a drought, usually diviners would be called to determine what the issue is and what um, path needs to be taken to address the, the concerns of the spirits or the gods or whoever. When, in terms of time, it varies. Sometimes um, divination is done in the morning. Uh, quite often divination is done whenever the client shows up and the diviner is available. In some cases, the divination is done in the evening or at night. A good, good example is the case of tail fox divination, which is done by the Dogon people. They set up the area in the evening and then leave it overnight so the fox who, which lives in the forest can come walk and leave its paw prints and in the next day they interpret the results of the, the, paw, the paw prints of the fox. Where is divination done? Again, this varies. Quite often it's done in shrines which sometimes can be the home of the diviner or a specific area for the community. Um, sometimes the diviners have offices which you go to, like you would go see a therapist or something like that. Uh, sometimes it's a consecrated outdoor location. We just talked about the example of Tail Fox divination amongst the Dogon people, where it's a consecrated space um, at the edge of the village where the forest starts. And this is considered a liminal space where um, the spirits operate. So that's where the tableau, the patterns on the ground are drawn and baited with food and other things that would draw the fox there so they can walk around and then the, the paw prints are interpreted. Sometimes divination is done at the home of the client, so the diviner will come, almost like a home visit that a doctor will pay. And sometimes divinations are done at public events, so if there is something that brings together the community, the divination might be performed to determine um, the outcome or the future of the community or what needs to be done. So the when and the where of divination is quite often in response to circumstance. How is divination performed? For this section, what I will do is go by type. So we'll go back and review each type of divination that we talked about previously. And for each type, I'll give an example from some people on the African continent and an overview of the process. And also any other little bit of information that I found interesting to share. So the first type of divination we looked at was lot divination, or if you're more familiar with the biblical term, I believe the casting of lots. And as we saw, um, Ifa divination is an example of lot divination, um, bone throwing is an example of lot divination, and the casting of tablets is an example of lot divination. And Ifa divination is quite well known. There are plenty of resources online to get familiar with Ifa. So I figured I would focus on bone throwing, also known as basket divination, because this is something that I was excited to learn a little bit more about. So the the idea is that you have a, a collection of items, bones, usually astragal bones, so the toe bones of specific animals, and you also have carved figurines or other things that have meaning to you, and each of these items uh, represent people, entities, concepts, directions, situations, or you know whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. And how this works is that it, within the particular system of divination, 
specific items mean specific things, but sometimes a designer also cultivates a relationship with a specific item. So you might have a figurine of an old woman and you, you know, look at that figurine as symbolic of an old woman and everything you know about old women you associate with that that particular figurine of an old woman so if you cast your lots and that old woman's figure falls in a particular way then it might speak to a grandmother or some older woman in your life or in the client's life influencing the situation depending again on what system of knowledge you're working with so the process is um, the bones, you can like shake them in your hand and throw. Quite often amongst many African people, the items get put in a basket. The example we see in the picture is the Chokwe people in Angola. The items get put in the basket, shaken about and then thrown. And the idea is that you're not just dumping them out, you're throwing them. Uh, I, one of the papers I read said it's done at a 45 degree angle which I thought was very specific but the idea is to have them fall so that whatever um, patterns they have in terms of their position and their relative position to each other can be interpreted and it's fascinating how this works because the idea is that if we're using just the regular way we think about things then we, we might not be able to see things from different perspectives but with this random throwing the, the positions uh, that the items take in and of themselves and their relative positions might open up a new way of thinking. One of the papers I cite here is Traditional African Divination Systems as Information Technology and I will have a link to a PDF of this paper because I highly recommend you take a look at it. This is a uh, Andre Krokamo who makes the argument that traditional African divination systems are really just a way of accessing information and the way he breaks it down um, there's actually a game that he uh, developed based on um, basket divination which was um, played by you know people working in um, non-profits and it was really interesting to see how new associations new ways of looking at things came up based on, on the, the items that they gave meaning to and then through and interpreted. So I'm not going to go too deep into this. I strongly recommend that you check out this paper. And I also have other resources um, in the references which will give a better overview of what uh, bone throwing or basket divination is really about. There is a uh, friction oracles, which um, is one of my favorites, honestly, because I think it's so interesting how it happened. So the idea is that you create fiction and the smoothness of the movement or the resistance in the movement is information. So um, an example that is found amongst the Baka forest people in Cameroon is the ritual divination that is done before people or before hunters go out in the forest. So the Gangas make a concoction of tree bark and particular leaves and they rub them between their palms um, until that smooth movement is interrupted and those the, the palms, their their palms that are pressed together tilt in a particular direction and that is supposed to indicate where the hunters will find game. Um, in some cases um, they will repeat these divinations. Um, multiple people will repeat it to kind of establish if the first person's process was done. Um, there are other examples of these which are, are, are found. Some people use sticks, some people use you know people's hands moving back and forth and the resistance you experience is indicative of, of what information that you're trying to get um, out of the divination um, consultation. XTCPC um, is the, the word I like, but it describes a bit of a gruesome process and um, I have to give a, a content warning here. This is kind of violent and what it involves is that um, an animal is cut open, it's ritually killed and it's cut open and its entrails examined to get information. So Cholo of the Tishana men in Ethiopia is an example of XTCPC and there are two kinds of Cholo. There's plain good old cholo which is performed for individuals and it's used to answer questions such as will a sick person get well, uh, will a proposed marriage be auspicious, will a journey go well and then there is cholo, nyerera cholo which is performed for collective purposes and is used to answer questions such as will there be a drought or war, will the government inflict new hardships which I think is a very interesting question. Will there be an epidemic? Will raiders attack? Will the community or family or the people in general prosper or be affected by disaster? And the paper by John Abing which I cite here gives a detailed um, example which he observed of Cholo being performed. So a woman um, suffered what I believe is a stroke 
And of course, since they didn't have access to modern medicine, a diviner was called to determine what had happened. So the, the uh, uh, I believe it was a sheep was brought and uh, water was brought and water was poured on the sheep and then it was ritually killed. Um, its entrails cut open. And how this works is that it's usually an interactive process. So um, the interpretation uses reference points rooted in the animal's uh, intestines, their structure, their shape, color, size, and position, things that are seen on them. And um, in this man's particular case, you know, they were looking at the different nodules on the, on the intestines, little black spots and things. And interestingly, in this case, the diviners said things will get better, but then the woman died. So uh, John Abing, you know, cornered the diviner later and said, hey, you know, what, what was that about? Does that mean that you were wrong? And the guy very gently kind of told him is that, you know, there was a point where he noted, everybody noted um, three black nodules, which he kind of glossed over. Um, but he said those three black nodules, when everybody saw that they knew that the outcome was bad, but he didn't want to say it there and then because what's the use of rubbing the people's pain in their face? So it's an interesting situation where the diviner predicted a good outcome but then the outcome wasn't good, but somehow um, it was, I guess, understood that you just don't say it out loud that this person is going to die. And um, the occasion determines the type of reading, the kind of information gleaned, the number of readers, and the main reader. And it's a dialogical process, so the, the, the diviner speaks, the people speaks. I really recommend you read this paper by John Abbings. It's available um, on JSTOR because it goes into detail about you know what the, the Cholo process is about. And who reads, who interprets, um, it could be the Mendenyere, who is the diviner or magician, a Tia, who is a ranking male member of the family, a Kabale, or an elder, or um, the oldest paternal male relative. But there is always a main reader who is an acknowledged expert, so quite often it would be the diviner himself. The word of the fox is what the Dogon people call their version of divining, which involves the pale white, pale white fox. And this has to this this system of divination is rooted in the Dogon um, origin myth, which involves um, uh, one of the entities which comes to Earth that which was created by Ama the Creator and uh, Ogo, who kind of goes into rebellion and tries to create on his own and doesn't succeed and in the end is cursed to become the pale white fox who doesn't talk um, but then is able to mediate between um, the, the spiritual realm and the human realm in compensation. So um, the paper by Laura Keteku Grio, Dogon Divination as an Ethic of Nature, is a really interesting read because it explains that creation myth and then it links, she links how um, this relates to divination. For the Dogon people, but what happens? Um, they, the 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 diviners create these patterns that you see in this picture on the ground at the edge of the village. Um, these tables, as they call them, they draw lines, and we'll go into details about all these this what all this means. And then they put food, you know, to entice the fox to come around. They do this in the evening, and the fox comes and walks around overnight. And then the next day, they come by and read the the paw prints and get information from it. So, beginning at sunset, the diviners draw the tables, and the tables are called kala, which means torn. And this refers to a point in the Dogon myth where uh, Ogu Ogu tore away the placenta of of the creation that um, Ama was was making. So these tables are those called Ama, and they are created in the sand at the outskirts of the village. And as we talked about the outskirts, you know, the villages that liminal space where spirits are believed to hang out. And then a circle representing the world and the hand of the fox is traced in the sand within the table. And an image of a spider, which um, plays a role in this creation myth, is drawn at the summit of an altar erected to the fox near the divining the tables that are drawn on the ground. And then offerings are made by diviners and placed in a calabash, which symbolizes Ogo's ark. Um, Ogo at one point used an ark to navigate the, the world as he was you know, going against Ama's wishes. And then they leave these things overnight. And the next day, the pale white fox, which is the animal you see in this picture with its blue cute face and gigantic ears, it leaves, walks across, eats the food and leaves paw prints, which are then interpreted in the presence of the parties concerned. 
So uh, Yurugu Kundune is what this uh, divination by the pale white, white fox is called. And the people who interpret these, um, these paw prints, they are called Yurugu Kundune. Um, and they can be heads of extended families, dignitaries and leaders of mass societies or healers. Interestingly, the Hogons and priests who are like the most spiritually adept people in Dogon society are not allowed to approach the Kala. If their role is to act as limits, act as, as, as um, arbiters almost of what knowledge is being generated. So they're almost like overseers of whatever knowledge is coming out because they have deep knowledge of Dogon history, Dogon mythology and cos cosmology. Uh, trans possession divination. Uh, trans or possession divination is seen in the Mwari cult of the Shona people in Zimbabwe. So there is this place called Matobu Hills, which holds a lot of significance for many South African people, the Shona and the Debele. And they have these caves, which you see in the picture, which have a great collection of these uh, rock art. Um, and so there, there are some caves from which it is believed that Mwari, the Shona supreme being, is uh, uh, speaks. But it is known that there are diviners and mediums who are possessed by Mwari who speak from these caves. Um, so that's an example of trans or possession divination. And, you know, they go through different processes to go into trance. There is dance, there is music. Sometimes psychoactive substances are consumed. And what's interesting is that these caves have these rock art, which um, I watched a documentary where if you just look at them, it's just rock art. But if you hold a, a fire, say a, a torch, with a fire burning and you move across these caves, the way these animals move, the way the patterns move, it's almost like watching a movie. And it is believed that that, that is how these rock art were, were um, used back in the day for, for ritual purposes. So it wasn't just paintings that people put up on the wall. So the Mwari cult of the Shona in Zimbabwe is an example to, um, of possession, uh, divination and possession by Mwari the Supreme Being in this case. In some cases, it's the spirit of an ancestor. It's a spirit, you know, in, in nature, it, it varies. There is also psychomotoric divination as done by the Nkoya people in Zambia. And this one is particularly associated with what is called the cult of affliction, which is groups of people who are believed to be affected by certain spirits. And the interesting thing about this is that it's music, drumming, and singing is how this divination is done. So, um... In Zambia, you know, there are specific spirits associated with specific songs. So if a patient has an insuppressible urge to dance to the tune of a particular kind of song, which carries a possession agent, then it's believed that this person is possessed by that agent. Interestingly, this is found also in Tunisia. And this is a notes from uh, Van Bins Binsbergen's study. Um, these two papers, which I cite here, interesting reading if you want to get into it. Um, it's found also in Tunisia, like I was saying. So it, there is um, singing tune peculiar to Sidi Muhammad, but remains indifferent to the tunes of other local saints. Then, you know, Sidi Muhammad's spirit is that which is communicating with the patient. So um, just by observing a person dancing, you can get a sense of what spirit is at work there and go into interpreting what the spirit is trying to communicate. Ominous divination, which is dream interpretation, is done by the Guaza or Zawa of Morocco. And it's the process of dreaming and then dream sharing, which is sharing your dreams with other people. And then there's also dream incubation, which we'll talk about later. So dreaming and dream sharing is mostly performed by women who have dreams called Alam or Manem. And or they have visions, uh, prophetic visions through lethargic sleep, which is called Urian. And lethargic sleep is this interesting phenomenon where a person falls asleep for days or weeks, and then they wake up and they have information that you know technically they are not supposed to know. Uh, dreaming and dream sharing and interpretation is a source of agency for women. Um, a lot of these societies can be very patriarchal, but if you are able to dream and communicate with spirits, the spirits of the dead saints, um, it's a source and agency of, of, of power and agency for these women because then they're able to, with the authority of the spirits and, and other entities that they get in contact with during these dreams, inform and control community narratives. Now, I should specify that this, this uh, kind of divination is specific to Sufi communities. And Sufism, of course, is a branch of Islam, the mystical tradition found within Islam. But it interacts with local traditions. And Sufism itself is a mystical tradition. So 
they have a lot of esoteric activities um, and dream interpretation is, is one of them. Uh, there are men uh, who are specialists, they're called Fukuha, and they're specialist dream interpreters. Um, and they use specific books and techniques that are found within the context of Sufism or Islam. And some women, though, as I was talking about, have deep knowledge and are considered skilled interpreters in their own right. And it's an interesting way in which that dynamic um, power sharing is maintained in the community. The Zawa also incubate dreams, a process called Itsikara. And how they do this is by sleeping on the tombs of saints. And it's believed then that whatever dreams you have when you sleep in the tomb of a saint is the saint communicating with you. And the shrine of Sidi Belgasem, a Sufi saint well-known in Morocco, is located in the village of Oued Ingos. And um, this is a popular site where people go to perform Itsikara. And there are you know, processes or ablutions, so people wash themselves and do specific things before they fall asleep um, and then they get interpretations and of course there are you know orthodox islamists who believe that this is you know wrong but in 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 many indigenous um, north african communities that mixture of islam and indigenous practices with sufi or other mystical traditions is highly influential so this paper by Araceli Gonzalez Vasquez is a really good one, Dreaming, Dream Sharing and Dream Interpretation as Feminine Powers in Northern Morocco. Highly recommended if you want to know more about an example of ominous divination as found amongst African people. So we've taken a look at the wide variety of divination practices and systems of knowledge within which they're contained, which exist on the African continent. What I find interesting, however, is how similar some of them can be even across great distances. We saw the example in Tunisia and Zambia of the cult of affliction where based on the way a person responded to drumming or music, a trained, uh, someone with a trained eye could tell what kind of spirit was possessing them. Another example um, is the case of the Gazawa people in Morocco, which uh, involve the lethargic sleep. So a person falls into a deep sleep and when they wake up, they've had prophetic dreams and they can you know, speak to uh, an individual's condition or something that's going on in the community. This also occurs, maybe not as lethargic sleep over a couple of days or weeks, but the similar pattern of falling unconscious and then waking up with um, prophetic utterances occurs amongst the Ejagam people who are found in Western Cameroon and Eastern Nigeria. This is specific to uh, a priestesshood called Mboko Dem, and these are women who serve the Ndem spirit, who is a water spirit found in the Cross Rivers region. And uh, these women will fall into... Um, fall into trances where they're unconscious and upon waking up they will be able to speak to situations in the community um, give advice on future events that are going to happen and things like that and um, there was a time when these women were very powerful in their communities uh, colonialism and changes in societal structure has lessened the influence that the Mbukundem priestess would have um, but there are still parts in the cross rivers region where women who fall into these trances still wield an enormous uh, amount of power. Sometimes they're even incorporated into evangelical churches, from what I understand. What just makes me excited about all of these, you know, similarities across long distances is the fact that they point to a lot of movement and transfer of knowledge which happened not just within the African continent, but between the African continent and the rest of the world. A good example is the case of the um, tablet divination, so Hakata and Sikiri, um, also Ifa, because they use that 16 combination or um, 256 uh, combination for interpretations based on that 2N notation. And this is something that is found um, as well in the I Ching, which is used in China. And there is one um, Arabic method of divination, tablet divination, which is also based on uh, the 2N notation. And um, one of the papers I looked at, the Van Brins Van Brinsenberg, I hope I'm saying that name right, uh, he has a section where he talks in detail about how human migrations, and we're not talking, you know, recent migrations, say 100, 200, or even 500 years ago, we're talking tens of thousands of years ago, the out of Africa migration and the back to Africa migration uh, is a possible explanation 
for why you find such similarities across long distances, not just, you know, North Africa and Central South Africa, but sometimes Central South Africa and even Asian countries. And what this, this encourages me because it shows that as humans, we've always been in communication with each other. We've always been sharing knowledge with each other. And there's a tendency um, amongst Afrocentric people to want to push the agenda that everything started in Africa and there is a lot of knowledge that was generated on the African continent and which we have been dispossessed of and it's been attributed to other people. But there has always been this movement of information amongst people. The I Ching system, for example, um, has a case where one of the letters just doesn't have any etymology in the Chinese language and someone studied it and found that the etymology is more linked to Greek mythology than to Chinese mythology, which you know, shows that knowledge obviously traveled from the Mediterranean to the Far East and there is really just nothing wrong with that. Um, I think this is part of how we can use indigenous ways of knowledge and, and ways of being to remember that we really are one big family on this continent, on this um, planet. We're one big family of human beings and we have a lot to offer each other and information exchange has always been happening and it's a great thing. So far, we've looked at what divination is with um, an exploration of the types of divination that exist on the African continent. We've also looked at who performs divination, when and where divination is performed, and how divination is performed with examples from different peoples on the African continent. So we arrive finally at the question of why. Why is divination performed? Why do people seek out the services of a diviner? And there are two main uh, reasons advanced for the existence of divination. One is to solve problems and the other is to assist with decision making. So um, in case of illness or some other kind of misfortune, death or extraordinary circumstances, people might seek the services of a, di a diviner to help them make sense of, of these occurrences. There's also the question of reducing uncertainty or reducing the anxiety that is associated with uh, taking certain risks. Um, people might seek out a, a diviner to help them make uh, uh, informed decisions. Uh, people might also want to stay in harmony with the gods, ancestors, or what whichever other supernatural forces they believe influence their lives. So the question for me, at least, is not a question, it's not one of whether or not divination is accurate. It's really, is it relevant to the person's worldview? And this is something to keep in mind because the interpretation of the, the divinatory messages is situated within a particular worldview. And something else to keep in mind is that divination is a core part of the worldviews of a good number of people across the world and a good number of spiritual traditions. So it's not something to just brush aside as superstition. There are um, studies that have shown some accuracy to divinatory practices. And I really like how Andre Krukan puts it in his paper that, you know, especially in the case of bone divination, where you have objects representing different concepts, people uh, modeling different relationships, it might just introduce a way to think about uh, a, a situation or examine the, the influences in a situation which might not occur to a person if they stick with their conventional way of thinking. So should you practice divination? That's something really for you to determine for yourself. Um, should you investigate divination perhaps out of curiosity? Again, I think that's something for you to investigate for yourself. I'm thinking if you are watching this video, you have some interest on the topic, but it, it opens up a different world and um, I really think that that is a determination that each individual has to make for themselves. I really appreciate you making time to go all the way to the end of this video. This was one of the longer ones. So I am just thrilled that you went on this journey with me. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment. We can start a discussion that way. Um, otherwise, you can follow the Mythological Africans page on Twitter. And I have some information coming up which will be helpful to that effect. As promised, here's a list of references to the papers which I used for this video. There is a link to a PDF copy of the paper by Andre Krukamp, which I've been going on and on about. And I really encourage you to take a look at it because it truly does present African divination systems, basket divination in particular, in a way that I've not seen before. And the game he devised based on basket divination is really thought provoking. You can also see um, the various examples that I mentioned in the discussion with 
even more detail um, than what I was able to fit into this video. So once again, thank you all so much for making time to watch. Uh, you can join the Mythological Africans community by following us on Twitter. The tag is Mythic Africans. We have daily posts, uh, threads sometimes. We also have meetings twice a week on Twitter Spaces where we get together to read folklore and talk about it. Um, the link tree on the Twitter page will take you to the newsletter which you can subscribe to to keep abreast with what's going on and what new developments are. And you can also access the Mythological Africans blog where we have blog posts and short stories. So once again, thank you for making time to watch the video and I wish you well.